knowing from the moment that you breathed life that it was all for a death a death that would bring life to all of your creation. And we thank you for it, Lord, for this special time of year where we recognize the birth of our God in human flesh. You became man that we might become the children of God. The Son of Man brought us to be sons of God. And we celebrate that today and every day, Lord. For you are a great and a mighty God and there is none like you, Lord. You alone are worthy of all worship and all praise. In Jesus' name. And everybody say praise the Lord. Give Him a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. And I welcome everybody from uh, Facebook and uh, that are joining us from literally around the world and yeah. across this nation of ours. Praise the Lord. And we're grateful to have you with us and be a part of the service and uh, participate uh, through prayer and, uh, and uh, union with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are all one and there is no distance. So praise God. <laughs> grateful to have you with us and all that we're able to be here today in person great to see your faces again. Amen. Many of you that have been battling the, the devil in different ways. Hallelujah. But uh, amen. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I'm going to, I thank you all this morning for uh, sharing your testimonies. And uh, literally, you'll know uh, the Holy Ghost was speaking because <laughs> I'm telling you what I'm going to talk to you about is exactly what everyone was saying uh, to some degree or another. Amen. And I, I want you to realize, because I'm going to, you know, I can get can kind of in a ditch sometimes here. And, uh, but I'm talking about faith. And I, even if it sounds like I'm going a different direction, just stay with me, because I'm talking about real faith. And faith that isn't, well, I want to get ahead of myself, but let me just say, I'm talking about it in maybe a little bit different way, but I'm talking about the same faith that was given to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Faith in God. Faith in the Word that became flesh. Amen? And so our God always causes us to triumph. There's no question about it. We know it. We have it based in the Word of God. Of course, triumph to us and God may not always look identical. I mean, that's the thing. That's where we struggle sometimes is trying to see through the eyes of humanity what God is actually seeing. Amen? So uh, we need to let God... You know, to get God's strength, what I'm finding out is you've got to come to the end of your own. To get real revelation, you've got to quit thinking human thoughts. Right. It's exactly what Don was talking about, Suzanne, Sheila. I mean, uh, Jody, it's just we have a tendency to get caught up in ourselves thinking, okay, I've got this figured out now. I just follow this path and I know I got it. We don't think the way God thinks unless we're thinking in agreement with His Word. And sometimes that conflicts with doctrine. Sometimes that conflicts with religion. Sometimes it just conflicts with our own personalities and our own way of uh, uh, you know, addressing situations and circumstances. But we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Not through me, not through my strength, not through my intellect, not through me, but through Jesus, who is the Word of God. Amen? And so by implication, if you just, even by definition for that matter, the scripture alone tells us there's going to be battles that we have to engage in. But battles are not ours, they're the Lord's. Right. But we still participate. Right. Even though the Lord is the, it's his battle, he's the one that's going to determine the victory, but he still wants us to participate. Amen? I mean, think just... Just the perfect examples. He gave us the Old Testament for what? For us to understand some things about how God works. These are all types and shadows, but they're all for our learning, for our edification, and for our understanding, right? And throughout the Old Testament, you look through the desert. From the time they left Egypt, the time they were in Egypt, 
from the time they were in Egypt until they left Egypt, throughout all of Canaan, throughout the Old Testament, people are in battles. Human beings are fighting fights. Even though the Lord said, the battle is mine, go, therefore. And that's where we get hung up sometimes. We think, well, God goes before us. Yes, he goes before us, but he expects us to be right behind him, willing to do whatever it is has to be done in the natural. Amen? And it's true in the New Testament. We're not called to be observers. Amen? We are called to be an army of the Lord. Now, the church has become far better at digging foxholes than it has been at fighting battles. That's the truth. We want to wave our hand. Again, please don't misunderstand me this morning. We want to wave our hand, and God does a miracle, and we just get to move on. I'm sorry. Read the Bible. It doesn't work that way. Amen. We've got to fight the fight of faith. It's a good fight, but it's a fight of faith. Now, if, it's not, if a fight is not required, then I don't understand faith. Right? Now, I was in the military. Some of y'all were. Michael, for sure. When a soldier gets orders, the soldier is trained to carry them out. Here's your orders. You don't go through a whole, you know, <sighs> that doesn't make sense. Oh, I don't know if we should do it that way. I, no, you just get the orders and you do it. That's what you're trained to do is obey. Do what you're told. Amen. So you've got to have confidence in whoever your leaders are. Amen. So that you can have the confidence to carry out whatever orders they're giving you. Amen. We're trained to carry out orders. We're not trained to decipher we're not trained to discern if that's the right order or not. Amen? We're not trained to necessarily comprehend entirely or understand entirely the battle plan. Because we don't know the whole battle plan. We only know our place. We only know where we are and what's going on where I'm at. Amen? I just had to learn to, my part and understand that it has importance to the ultimate victory. That's true. Physically, it's true spiritually. There's a confluence that takes place. What I know and what somebody else knows that I'm just being obedient to, even though I may not understand it. I know if I do my part, it should work. Amen? Praise the Lord. Look at this quickly. Now, I believe in the Word of God. I believe in miracles. I've seen them. I've experienced them. But I've also been in situations, like Don mentioned, where I have prayed and believed God and thought I was in agreement with the Word of God and not saw the outcome that I expected. And I've been in situations where I was struggling with things, confessing the Word of God, declaring what God said, and yet struggling with myself, with my own issue, whether it was a health issue or whatever it was. God brought me through it. Now, I, it didn't happen the way I thought it should happen. It didn't happen when I thought it should happen, but it happened. Yeah. God had a way that he planned on doing it to give me the victory. It just wasn't the same thought I had. But I still got the victory. It just didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen or the way I thought it should happen. Okay? So look at this in Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 33. And I, I pray this, and I, we've confessed it before and talked about it. It's the disciples. They're under pressure. Yes. They've they're got some problems. They're, there are people being murdered and thrown in jail and attacked and all sorts of things going on. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Yes. Now, we could say that about the, the natural world, but we know that whatever the natural world is threatening, it's coming from someplace else. Right. What we're seeing is demonic. Everything from abortion to, you know, everything we're seeing, the, the whole transgender, all of this stuff, it's demonic. This is not coming out of some human being's thought processes. So, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. Now, why did they, why did they feel like they needed that? Have we Praise the Lord. God is on our side. We're full of the Holy Ghost. Why are you praying and asking God for boldness? Because you're hearing their threatenings. Because you know what the potential can be. You're not 
You're not giving in. You're not giving up. You're not saying, but you're calling on God because you don't have an answer. So by stretching forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Praise the Lord. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. That's why we come together, church, especially in times like this. Neither said any of them that aught of these things which he possessed was his own, but they all had things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. So they had the boldness to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the grace of God was upon them. Yes. Now that's what we got to have. Yes. Now we might rather have him just wipe out all of these people that are threatening, but God doesn't work that way because those are people that God wants to save. In spite of how they are perceived by us, in spite of what their motives are and whatever their agenda is, God died for them as well. Now, let me just start down this path here, but please. I believe, I pray, I believe, I declare, I confess. But healings, deliverance, miracles, raising the dead, listen to me, were as rare in the days of Jesus as they are today. A first century church it was as rare to see somebody raised from the dead. It was as rare to see people delivered of demons and all of that stuff then as it is now. Praise the Lord. Look at Matthew 12, verse 22 and 23. I'm not denying. I'm not trying to discourage. We need to pray for the sick. We need to believe for resurrections. We need to cast out demons. We need to do all of this. I'm just saying if you don't see it happen, don't stop doing it. Because I'm telling you, they didn't see it all the time either, or it wouldn't have been a rare thing. We had this idea that the Holy Ghost fell, and everybody got healed, and everybody got delivered, and everybody got saved, everybody got born again. But then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed. Why were they amazed if it happens all the time? Yeah. They were amazed because it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. Is not this the son of David? It must be Jesus because we don't see people getting healed. We don't see deliverances. Please don't think I'm trying to dumb this down or trying to take anything away from what God wants to do through us. I'm telling what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get to is it takes perseverance. You're going to have to see some, what seems to be not successful, amen, and continue doing it in spite of it. Now, I'm not going to go through all these scriptures just for the sake of time, but in Mark 2, let's do look at that, verse 11 and 12. I say unto thee, Arise, take up your bed, go your way to your house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw this. We, we've never seen anything like this. And then Mark 6, 5, he talked. Jesus went to his own hometown. Nobody got healed. A few people had headaches. That was it. Because of unbelief. Not because Jesus wasn't capable of doing it. Not because he wasn't filled with the fullness of the Godhead, that the Holy Spirit was operating through him, but because people didn't receive it. We don't know why, we just know they didn't. He could do no mighty works there. Jesus, we're talking about God in the flesh. Now, I know. You can think, Nathan, you're going the wrong way here. You're, you're discouraging. No, for God's sake, I'm being honest. I'm being an adult. I'm being a grown-up here. And Jesus is expecting us in this last day, will I find faith or will I find people who think they're working magic tricks of some kind? He's looking for faith. And faith means even when I don't get what I think I should get, I'm still going to believe the Word of God, and I'm going to continue to declare the Word of God. Whether I see it or I don't see it, it's still the truth. 
I'm going to call those things that are not as though they are, amen, until they are. And if that means until I'm off this planet, that's the way it'll be. But I'm still going to keep believing and I'm going to keep declaring because that's the only way it can happen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. In Acts chapter 3, and you don't need to go there, but I'll just, you know the story anyway. It's Peter and James. They're, they're, they're walking along. They see this guy. He's been blind all of his life. They walk by. Silver and gold have we none because he's begging. But what we have, give we to you. Be healed. Instantaneously, the guys can see. And everybody was freaked out. They couldn't believe it. They were saying, this is some other guy. It can't happen. The guy's been blind all of his life. What, the point I'm making is, this didn't happen just every time they walked by somebody, somebody got healed. Or there'd have been a, there'd have been, there wouldn't have been the same kind of uh, persecution and murdering, and, and, and jail time, and all the rest of it. If it had happened every time it, you come in contact with someone who had a need, believe me, there would have been an uproar. There would have been an uprising. It would have changed everything. But it didn't. It happened. I'm not denying it happened. And it happened many times. But it didn't happen all the time, and it didn't happen in so much that it never got to the place where it wasn't amazing to people, because the amazing part of it is what drew people to God and made them realize this is God. This is a God thing. Amen? Mocking, unbelief was as prevalent then as it is now. When Jesus went to raise that dead girl, they laughed him to scorn. They mocked him. They said, you idiot. How dare you embarrass this family by trying to raise somebody from the dead? Am I saying we shouldn't do that? No, I'm saying we should, but be prepared for what you're going to face when you do it. You better have some faith. You better have some courage because you're going to be, they're going to try to humiliate you and everybody else. And God, ultimately, is what they're after. I'm, I'm saying all this this morning, and I'm going to continue doing it, because it's time that we grow up. It's time that we mature. It's time that we realize just because we don't get it the way we want it doesn't mean we stop doing it. It doesn't, because many are going to fall away, Don. Why? Because they're not getting it the way they want it. They're not getting it the way they think they should get it. We're not going to make God do anything that God hasn't already done. We're not going to change his mind about how he operates. We've got to get in tune with Him. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. God's people were not removed from the world. They were not removed from suffering. They were dying. They were being murdered. They were being jailed. They were being beaten. They were suffering. Like the unbelievers around them. This isn't normal. This, I know this isn't Pentecostal I'm talking here. I know this isn't the kind of charismatic thing that we like to hear, but I'm telling you, church, if we don't toughen up, if we don't just stop digging foxholes and start fighting, yes. we're going to, they're going to find us buried in those foxholes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Christians, think about this. All around the world, I'm thinking of Sam in Pakistan and, and people in Afghanistan and all around the world. These are God's children. He loves them just the same as he loves me and you. There's no difference in the way he feels about them. And yet they're being killed. They're being murdered. They're being butchered. They're being thrown in jail. They're being persecuted every day. Just because it isn't happening to us doesn't mean it's not happening. It's happening everywhere all around the world. There's horrible things happening to Christians. But because we've been blessed to live in a country of laws, and of a, 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 up until recent times at least, a government that was right. wanting to respond to the people. Right. A government of the people, for the people, by the people, right? Yeah. That's not true in most places, but God's the same yeah. in every one of these places, yeah. whether it's in the United States or it's whether it's there. Yes, Lord. In the world, he said, you will have tribulation. Well, we kind of just skim over that because we live in the United States of America. And until recently, we haven't suffered much persecution. 
But I promise you this, you're going to see more of it. It ain't going away. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Well, good. But look. So what's he saying? You've got to abide in me and my word in you. If you want over, overcoming power, if you want to overcome the tribulations and the attacks and the warfare that are in this world, you better be in me. Right. Praise the Lord. You better be in faith. Look at James chapter 1, verse 2 through 8. I hope I don't discourage people this morning. I hope I anger you. I hope I get you to a place where you, you want to fight. I hope I, I hope I get you to the place where Sally was when they grabbed her purse at Target and she started fighting the guy and chased him across the parking lot. It was stupid from a natural perspective, but it showed her courage. She wasn't thinking about what the consequences might be. She's thinking, that jerk just took something that doesn't belong to him. It's mine. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank God. He delivered her. They got some credit cards and, and, and a, a, some cash. It's money. It's just stuff. And the bank took care of all of it. We got everything covered up. And fortunately, we don't mix it. None of the church accounts are in, even in the same bank as our personal stuff. So they didn't have any access to any of the church accounts or anything else. What they got was a few hundred bucks, basically, that we'll get back. Yes, you will. And I prayed on the way <laughs> over there that, God, whatever they get, the enemy stole it, and you got to give it back seven times. Yes. You're going to take it back seven times. Yes. Amen. She might have been stabbed. She might have been shot. She might have been beaten with a club. All of those things were possibilities, but God didn't allow it. Yes. Amen. She was delivered. You see, she delivered. They stole 500 bucks from you. They got credit cards. They got access to your social security, all the stuff. No. They didn't get nothing. No. They didn't get nothing but an old purse yeah. that I just assumed she didn't carry anyway. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. God, God delivered her. Now, it may not have looked like it if you were there taking photos at the time that it happened. But think of what the consequences could have been. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. When was the last time we had a joy party? <laughs> Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Why would you need patience? Because everything doesn't happen as quickly as we want it to happen. The Word of God doesn't always happen instantaneously when we confess it. But we have to confess it. We have to continue to confess it. We have to do it in patience, knowing that ultimately it will prevail if we don't give up. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So when you're struggling with COVID, when you're struggling with your children that are struggling with COVID, when you're struggling with finances or when you're struggling with the, the crime that is getting worse and worse around us. You need to keep your mind focused on what God said. You can't be listening to the world. You can't be listening even to your own imagination. You've got to have a one-track mind. What God said is the ultimate outcome that I'm going to experience. No matter what it looks like today, no matter what it feels like today, no matter what I'm thinking, even what I'm feeling, right. it's what God said yes. that is going to take place. Yes. Amen? Amen? And I'll see it here or I'll see it there. Yes. But I've got to believe it till I'm over there. Yes. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. 
It's about living by faith, church. We're at a time where we do not get to just be churchgoers anymore. We're going to have to live by faith. Living. And how, what's living by faith? Living from our identity in Jesus Christ, the author and finisher, excuse me, of our faith. When healing doesn't happen immediately. Thank you, Jesus, for healing. Thank you, Lord, that by your stripes I was healed. Hallelujah. When I don't get the immediate outcome I want, I continue to believe in Christ and his finished work. Praise the Lord. You continue to believe the Word of God. Yes. If everything is idyllic and there's no friction, there's no obverse, there's no, there's no contradiction to your faith in God's Word, then you don't need faith, church. Right. And Jesus said, when I come, He didn't say, well, I find a lot of churchgoers. He said, will I find faith. God said the just, or those that have been justified, they shall. Maybe, hopefully, no, they shall live by faith, which tells me you're not going to have a choice. If you're going to live, it's going to be by faith, or you're not going to make it. Second right. Kings chapter 7 <clears throat> and verse 3. <clears throat> It doesn't hurt. It just comes and goes. I praise the Lord. It just, it's just the voice part of it. It's like puberty all over again. It's kind of exciting in a way. <laughs> praise the Lord. Second uh, Kings chapter seven verse three. This is the story of the siege that's on this this uh, nation or on this uh, city, and they've been walled in, and they're, they're eating their own children now. It's gotten so insane. The enemy's attack against them and pressure that's put on them. They're starving to death. And, and there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, why are we sitting here till we die? They, they decided better to do something, even if it's wrong. Right? It's better to fight back. It's better to do something than just sit here and take this until we're dead. Right. Amen? Look at verse 5 through 8 now, still in the same chapter, Suzanne. They rose up in the twilight to go out into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Because they had said, look, uh, what's the worst that can happen? We stay here, we starve to death. We go there, they kill us. Just give it a shot. It's better than just letting circumstances dictate to us. And so the Lord, for the Lord of hosts had made a host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots. Four lepers dragging themselves out there. And the Lord made this whole army hear another army coming. Noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents, their horses, their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also away and went and hid it. In other words, they got the spoils. Now here's, here's the thing we need to see about this. He doesn't say for the strongest best looking, uh, most powerful, most faithful. No, four lepers. Who, leprosy is usually defined as sin. So these are four guys that don't have it all together. They're not, they're not perfect Christians. They're not, they don't have all that. And, and they're also physically infirmed. So they've got emotional baggage. They've got spiritual baggage and physical baggage. But they made a decision to let's trust God. And just see what happens. And God rewards them. And through them, he rewards the entire city because eventually they take stuff back. They said, it's not right for us to sit here and become gluttons and rich men and let them starve to death back at the city. Amen? Amen? They looked at an impossible situation 
I said, let's give it a shot. The worst that can happen is we'll die. And that's going to happen anyway. Amen? Look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1. We know that Moses is a type of Christ. Joshua is a type of the Holy Spirit. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, chapter, or excuse me, verse 5 through 8. I'm just skipping some, or I'm sorry, 5 through 9. There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide and inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, Mayest, uh, thou mayest uh, observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So God says, I'm going to be with you in power. Everything that I did for Moses, I'm going to do for you and more. But here's how it's going to work. You're going to have to believe what I've said. Yes. Because there are giants in the land. There are enemies fortified cities there and the people are going to freak out and I know you're just a man but be of good courage if you'll do everything that I've said if you'll say everything that I've said you're going to be a greater conqueror than Moses ever dreamed of being that's what God is saying to us today I'm not telling you there are no giants I'm not telling you there are no walled cities. Right. I'm telling you the Lord's going to go before you, and yes. I've given you the grace to go and do what I've told you to do. Yes. But you've got to go do it, even when it looks like it ain't going to work and everything that I'm telling you is so crazy and insane, and you're feeling it and you're not experiencing it, and you're seeing people doing the wrong thing, and you're feeling, man, am I misunderstanding God? Have I, have I lost it altogether because I prayed and I didn't get my miracle? I prayed and I didn't get immediately healed. I prayed and my wife still got attacked. I pray, You know what I'm saying? But be strong and be of good courage. And keep on keeping on because you are going to come out victorious. Ultimately, it has to happen. If you keep my word, it shall come to pass. Praise the Lord. God shows up. He shows up in Joshua. He shows up in Jesus. He shows up in the Holy Ghost. He shows up in us if we will not give in to the flesh. Doesn't mean there won't be trials. Doesn't mean there won't be giants. Doesn't mean there won't be battles. Doesn't mean there won't be persecution. Doesn't mean there won't be challenges. Doesn't mean there won't be questions. <laughs> Let me just ask you something. Jesus came. The scripture says, God came in the flesh. Now, just be honest with yourself here for a minute. We've got a lot of revelation, and I'm not denying that. But there's a whole lot we don't understand. Do you know everything of God? I mean, do you know everything about God? Do you know everything about man? No, we don't. So this unknowable, to some degree, God wraps himself in an unknowable man to some degree. And we claim we got the answer. We know. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm still being positive. I'm just, I'm being positive by, by addressing the realities that we're facing and challenging you, I think the way God challenged yeah. Je, uh, uh, Je, 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 yeah. that guy back there that 
came after Moses. Joshua, you know what I'm saying? The way he challenged Jesus. Jesus said, if it's possible for this to be accomplished some other way, then that's what I want. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that's where all of the apostles, all the disciples, all of the believers had to come to at some point if they were going to be victorious. And God is addressing us. We are the last day's church. So guess what? We're going to get stuck with the same battles that the first church had. We're going to go through some same thing. And we better grow up and we better get some guts and we better strap on, amen, the armor and figure there's going to be battles ahead, but I'm going, I'm going to run to the battle because the worst that can happen is I'll die and be with the Lord. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I'm known. That's Paul. I mean, this guy wrote two, he knew some stuff. He had been to the third heaven. He had revelation. And yet, this is, those are his words. I, don't, I haven't got this all sorted out. I'm looking at it, but I'm only seeing through a glass darkly. I've got revelation, but I can't put it all perfectly together. I know some stuff, but it doesn't seem to be complete because it doesn't always happen the way I think it ought to happen. But then I'll know, even as I am known. I don't want to mess that who I am known there by what I'm doing here. I want to I wanna be known by God here and now as I will be there. Even with my flaws, even with my fears, even with my all of that. I'm going to do it scared if I have to, but I'm going to do it either way. Praise the Lord. Genesis 1.1. We're going to win, church. It just won't look like we want it to look sometimes. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Praise the Lord. Colossians, remember this, now we'll come back to it. Colossians 1, verse 15 through 20. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Praise God. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Everything. That's where it ultimately resides. And what's weird is in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. Now, from a human perspective, we'd say, okay, something's left out here. In the beginning, God, where did God come from? Or maybe that's just me. In the first verse of Genesis, you can see immediately, God doesn't answer every question we ask. He just doesn't. In fact, in Hebrew, that first letter of the word, uh, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, is Bereshit. And the first letter is the letter Bet. And that letter corresponds with our letter B. It's the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, just like B is the second letter of the English alphabet. Now think about it. In the beginning, 
God starts with the second letter. He left out something. He left out where he came from, and he left out the first letter. Now, we'll get to that in a little bit, but I'm saying, see, God doesn't think the way we think. He doesn't operate. We would think, okay, if you're going to start at the beginning, let's start at the beginning. Let's make it all, right, coordinate. Let's make it all work together. So why do the scriptures begin with the second letter of the alphabet instead of the first? Because the scripture doesn't answer every question that we have. And not all all knowledge is accessible to us as human beings. Some is reserved for God himself. Even the shape of the letter bet shows us it's, a cl- it's closed on the right side and it's open on the left. It's like a, a box without a closure on the left side. Now, if you know anything about Hebrew, you know it reads from right to left, which is another indication here that this is kind of squirrely from a human perspective. Mm-hmm. It's closed on the right side, but it's open on the left side. And since you read from right to left in Hebrew, the scriptures start with a letter that is open in the direction of the reading, but closed toward the direction of the beginning of the text. Mm -hmm. So it's open in the way that you're reading it, but it's closed in the way that it appears in the text, so you can't get to it. Amen? The bet is a one-way sign saying, you need to start here. You just, you, there's no point in trying to get beyond this. Try to go back, try to find more. Just start here where I started. Just trust me. I know where I'm taking you. Praise the Lord. At the first letter, and then you move forward. Start where I put you to start. At that first letter, even if it's not the letter you think it ought to be, just start with that letter and move forward and ask, what God, what is your will? And how should I live that will out? Because the letter bet is closed on the top, on the back, and on the bottom. So he's telling us it's futile to speculate about what's existed before creation. Don't have to figure out when God started, where God started. Humanly speaking, there's no way of figuring that out anyway because he always was. What, what existed before creation? What difference does it make? If he wanted us to know, he'd have told us. He'd have said before the beginning. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, what, what's everything about heaven? No, there, it's closed. And it's, what about how, all that's happening in hell? What, what, what will all of hell be? It's closed. Apparently we don't need to know. The point is, the bet is a discouraging study. It's not, it's not to get us to not question, but it's teaching that the Bible shouldn't be used as a vehicle or as a, as a means uh, for these endless ideas and doctrines that lead us nowhere but divisive things. And there's another paradox. You can study God's Word all of your life and never get to the end of it. We know that just from simple little scriptures that we've read hundreds and hundreds of times and then all of a sudden I go, wow, where'd that come from? And if I keep reading that same scripture 10 years from now, I might see something else totally never observed before, never understood before. We're never going to get, I'm not saying don't study and that's not what God is saying. He's just saying, no matter how much you study, you're never going to get to the end of this. You're never going to get all the answers. But you you can't force the Bible to answer your every question. Don mentioned this, and it just went off in me when you said it. Twisting, turning the text until it satisfies our curiosity, until it comes to some place where we go, okay, there we go, now now I'm getting it. 
How, how much do I have to wrangle it and manipulate it in order to get it to say what I want it to say? Instead of just saying, I don't get this, God. You're going to have to reveal this to me, and I'll trust you even if it doesn't fit my paradigm, even if it doesn't fit my, my perspective. God just simply chooses not to reveal some things. Why, I don't know, but it must be for the right reason or he would do it. Daniel chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. Daniel's had this tremendous revelation. And he said, I heard, but I didn't get it. And we think, hey, Daniel, are you kidding me? And I said, Lord, what will be the end of this? Or how is this all going to play out? And the Lord said, just go on about your business, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. It's not for you to know. I gave you some revelation, but you don't need to understand everything. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. I'm a, I'm a studier. I'm a reader. I, I want to know. I want answers. So it's frustrating a lot of times when you go to the Word of God because you're thinking, am I this stupid? Why am I not seeing this? Maybe because I don't need to see it. I'm not ready for what it is I'm wanting. I'm like the 12-year-old wanting the keys to the car. Looks like a lot of fun, man. I'd love to get behind the wheel. I've seen Dad do it. No, not yet. The day will come. There's a time. But it's not yet. And he said unto them, or when they therefore were come together and asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. We don't like that. We think, well, come on. No, these are believers. These are disciples. These are followers of Jesus. And he said, no. It's not for you to know everything that God knows. He's got times and seasons that you don't need to know about until that time or that season arrives. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, only the Father. So we're not in bad company here. Yeah. Right? Now I said, why the bet? Why, why did you start at the beginning, Lord? Because he wants us to follow his words follow his plan and his purpose and he has a way of making this happen and here is what got my attention you know jesus is the alpha and the omega that's that's greek in hebrew he is the aleph and the tall he is the first letter of the alphabet so god didn't start with jesus in terms of our understanding he started with a path my words, follow my words. Amen? Jesus is going to give you the answers. Amen. Jesus is going to explain the word that I'm giving you. I don't need to give it to you every single dot and tittle. I'm going to give you my instructions, and Jesus will reveal to you what you need to know. Amen. And so... Even, just think about it, even in Jesus' earthly life, he began to fulfill this. Right? He, he taught how the word should be applied. How the word works, because they had it all confused and screwed up. And he comes and starts explaining the word of God. Showing his followers how they were to live it out. How you were supposed to walk this thing out. Make it a reality in your own life. Again, this is about faith. Jesus is the Aleph. He is the author and the top, the, the finisher of our faith. And he is the word made flesh. Yes. I'm going to skip some scriptures just for the sake of time. But 
God doesn't answer every doubt or explain everything to our satisfaction. And we all know that if we're honest with ourselves, even though we sometimes fight with ourselves about it because we don't want to admit that for some reason he didn't do it for me. I didn't get the resurrection I was expecting. I didn't get the healing. I didn't get the deliverance. I, it didn't happen like I thought it should happen. This is why we need to be honest, like I'm being with you today. Not because we're denying or, or downing anything that God can do or what his possibilities are. No, we've got to believe all of that and act on it. But we also have to be adult enough to admit it always doesn't happen the way we think it should. And when it doesn't, it's not God's fault. It's not because God is doing, not doing what he said he would do. It's because I'm not ready to understand everything that God has. Or everything God does. Doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't give me the right to not operate according to his word. Because it's the only hope we've got, church. The Hebrew word for heaven is shamaim. And uh, the, the word for earth is aretz. And when you hear a Hebrew word that ends with I am, you know that that's a plural word. It's a word that's plural. So the word for heaven is plural. But the word for earth isn't. And it's not just the words, it's what those words represent. That which is earthly is singular. Flesh. Limited. And that which belongs to the physical realm, which is earthly, is finite. Everything that is physical is limited. Da. That's why no matter how much of the earthly intellect realm that you operate in or that you manage to accrue, it'll never bring you completion. And here's the deal. Life is focused on the physical. I mean, those of us that have been sick, what were we focused on? Yes, we're confessing healing, but I'm telling you, your body was screaming. It was getting your attention. And, and if it wasn't, you were in a coma. I'm, t I'm just being honest. Amen. I was, I'm confessing my healing when I'm in those dark, nightmarish situations you're talking about. I know what you're saying. But I was still in my... Dark place. I'm, I'm confessing the word of God, but I'm not experiencing anything of it. Not in the physical. Because my physical is limited to the physical. Life is focused on the physical. It's life filled with limitations. It's life filled with sickness. It's life filled with lack, with bondages, with death, with dying. Oh, Nathan, you are an encouraging spirit this morning. I'm being honest. I'm being adult. I'm being a warrior in the army of God. I'm, I'm facing the realities that we're facing and saying they do not give us the bottom line. They are not the final word. They are realities in the physical realm. There's no question about it. But they're not the final word. If you empty yourself of physical things, a bet, the just the understandable, then you empty yourself of limitations. And that's why Jesus comes on the scene, the Aleph, and said, abide in me, and I'll abide in you, and you will ask what you will, and it will come to pass. Yes. You'll produce fruit. Because why? You've left the physical, and you're now functioning in the spirit. That's the battle we're facing ultimately. And if God is teaching us anything through this COVID, through all the situations and circumstances we're going through, it's to wake up, folks. Yep. You don't have it in yourself to do this. No way. The things of the earth, creation itself. That's why he starts with the bet. In the beginning, God created. The creation. It's finite. It's in time, it's, it has limits. But the things of heaven are infinite, timeless.
eternal. The physical is limited, but the spiritual is unlimited. God is taking us, church, is what I'm saying. He's trying to get us into the spirit. He is. Yeah. Before we die. He is. Before we leave the physical. Naturally speaking. Right. He's trying to show us how yes, to escape the confines of the physical. Yes, he is. So that we can experience yes, right. the infinite, yes, yes. everlasting, eternal yes. On earth. Father. On earth as it is in heaven. You can't escape living in the earth realm. That's where we're at. But you don't have to live of the earth realm. Don't let this define our existence. Our reality. Isaiah 55, 9. God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But he goes on to say, Tammy mentioned this this morning, in verse 11, but if you'll stay in my word, if you'll stay in the way that I think, then there's some consequences that you'll get to experience. And that's verses 12 and 13. you'll go out with joy be led forth with peace the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands yes. instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree and it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off praise the Lord Galatians 3 1 through 3 Praise the Lord. I'm trying to go faster. Hallelujah. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit are you now made perfect by the flesh? The spiritual heaven is Shamaim. And the Shamaim has no limitations. And so therefore you become unlimited. I'm not going to go there for, again for the sake of time, but in Hebrews 11 it talks about us being grafted in yes. to the Hebrew nation. Yes. In fact, the scripture goes on in other places to talk about you are the true Israel. Because it's by faith. We are the sons of Abraham because of faith. Amen. Now, so we are Hebraic. We are Hebrews as far as God's concerned. And remember what Hebrew means. Those that cross over. We've been grafted in. We are spiritual Israel. We are the children of Abraham. What did, what did the Hebrews cross over? Well, they crossed over the Red Sea and the Jordan River. They crossed the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land. But first they had to cross the Red Sea to get out of Egypt. Before they could enter into the new land, into the Promised Land, to where the promises of God were, to where the Word of God was to be fulfilled, they had to leave the old land. You can't enter unless you leave. You can't enter the spiritual realm without leaving the physical realm. The physical will always limit you. It's a law of physical existence. That's the law I'm more concerned about. I got the victory over the other law. Jesus already fulfilled that and took care of it. It's the law of physical existence that I'm struggling with. It's a simple law, but it's, but it's profound. Abraham was the first Hebrew. And what was the first thing he had to do? Get out. That's what God said. Get out of there. The rest, all of the blessings, all of the promises, all of that rested on those words. Get out. 
And we think it's okay to be fearful. Okay, your fear is going to come. But what you, how you apply that fear is what's going to either give you victory or destroy you. When you start talking fear, you're, you're, what you're telling me is you haven't listened to the command to come out. You're still bound there, and that's why you can't experience the Yahami. Because you're still Eretz. You're still focused on the earth. You're still confined to the natural way. Praise the Lord. Second Corinthians five, sixteen and seventeen. We've 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 been so focused and rightfully so on, on the grace of God and being delivered from the law that we've misunderstood. There are law, natural laws that we've got to get loose of too. One of the things Jesus did with Peter, come. What was he doing? He was trying to get him to come out of the natural laws of this realm. Yes. Gravity. Yes. I'm not saying go out here and jump off a building. I'm saying, but those things that have us bound are the things that are connected to this physical body. And this physical body, it needs healing. But it can't get healed from the physical realm. It has to come from the supernatural. It has to come from the spiritual. That's what God showed us during our month-long episode. Why? Because I wanted the instantaneous thing, and when it was all done, I said, okay, God, thank you, Jesus. And he said, uh, for healing? And I thought, well, I, for the longevity, for the bullheadedness of not just giving in. No. I healed you. I just didn't heal you the way you thought you were going to get healed. And let me say this, Jamie. So did Peter. Not the way we wanted not the way you wanted, not the way maybe even he wanted in the natural. But God's got some things going on that we don't know anything about. And I guarantee you, you couldn't get Peter back here with a billion dollar check. You couldn't get him back here with all the promises of, of anything that could happen in this earth. He's got a reward that all we can do is dream of. I know that doesn't satisfy our natural man. I'm just saying that's the difference. That's the struggle. Where, wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. What is he saying? He's no longer of the flesh. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're now of the heavens. You're now of the Spirit. Well, this goes back to Galatians where he says, you know, having begun in the spirit, having begun from the heavenly, now you're going to go back to the fleshly and think that you can operate spiritually from that perspective. It, does, it won't work that way. You won't get healings. You won't get your deliverance. You won't get the things that you're after by functioning in that realm. See, getting out is a holy act. Jesus called his disciples. He said, come, come with me. To do that, they had to leave where they were. Right. We want change. We want something better. We want something new. Then we've got to be willing to leave the law, no. that law of the physical realm. Amen? Amen? And it isn't just the physical realm, but also the spiritual. If you want to get to a place where you're not, then you have to leave the place where you are. I mean, that's deep, I know, but just praise the Lord. You've got to leave the old to enter the new. This is what God's dealing with me about, with us about. It's a bat I know it's a battle because our minds are stubborn. They're bullheaded and they're, they're trained in a certain way and they don't want to yield. They want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 4, 21 through 24. And see, the problem with that is it, it, it spills over into the supernatural. Yeah. That by his stripes we're healed. We lay hands on the sick and they recover. We cast out demons. There's still too much of the flesh. We're functioning too much from the flesh. Even though we're trying to make something supernatural heavenly take place, there's still too much of this function, amen, that is stopping it because it can't happen in the flesh. 
It's, it's exactly what, I mean, Suzanne, I've had goosebumps. It's exactly what you were saying. I'm driving along and I'm talking in tongues. I'm speaking a heavenly language, right? And all of a sudden, I'm thinking that ought to be, thus saith the Lord. No, thus saith the new creation in Suzanne, which is the Lord. But he was telling her, listen, yes, Suzanne, you are Suzanne. But you don't function as Suzanne. You function as Suzanne in Christ. Yes. It isn't how much we can do with this. It's how quickly we can get rid of it. Yes. How quickly we can let go of it. And it's, and it's controlling yes. aspects in the way we think and the way we function. This, look, church, it's why he says, this is by the renewing of your mind. You, can, you can't do it with the old mind. You can't do it with the mind of the natural, the physical. It, it will stop you every time. Because it wants answers that God's not going to give you. Hallelujah. Be renewed. So if, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, in the word, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And we've, you know, we've made that all about, okay, don't drink. Don't do this. Don't watch that. Don't have that. That has nothing to do with what he's talking about. He's talking about be who you really are so that you can do what I've told you you can do. Because you can only do it by the Spirit. Yes. Right. Yes. Genesis 1.1 again, he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now let me just do you a little science thing here. I don't want to lose you, but for every effect, there has to be a cause. This is how we look at in the beginning, or this is how I saw it. In the beginning, okay, in the beginning, but this can't be the beginning because God's creating everything. So what am I missing here? Right? For every effect, there has to be a cause. For every phenomenon, there has to be a reason. Bet or Aleph. Creative, natural, physical, or God, or Christ, or the Word of God, however you want to go by it. Nothing can exist without a cause behind it. You can't have something from nothing. Everything has to have a cause. So if everything has a cause, then what's the cause for everything? This will keep you up at night, praise the Lord, when you... Hebrews 11.3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. On the natural, that'll just give you a headache by itself. Because it's talking to the Spirit. It's speaking to the Spirit. What's the cause for the universe? Right? What's the cause for existence? What's the cause for healings? For miracles? For signs? For wonders? For creation? The cause can't be the effect. So the cause has to be something other than physical. For example, the universe. Everybody's heard it. Well, the Big Bang. Just the Big Bang. That's what got it all going. The cause can't be the effect. So the cause had to be something other than physical. Which means if the Big Bang were the beginning... Then it came from nothing. But if it came from nothing, then it has no cause. And if it has no cause, then it can't exist. Use their own science on it. Then it's, it's magic, I guess. Right? But what if the universe always was? 
then it had no beginning. And if it has no beginning, then it never started. And it can't exist. So it never was. Now stay with me. Magic. Right? Either the universe began from nothing and then can't exist, or it has no beginning and therefore never began, in which case it can't exist. Right? I'm using, I'm using logic here, even though it sounds crazy. So if that's true, then we can't exist. But we do exist because we're looking at each other and touching each other and communicating with each other. So the answer can only be that which cannot be explained. And yet, it explains everything. Praise the Lord. Now, when you're going through something, remember this. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but remember this. That which you cannot make sense of, and yet make sense of everything. See, the only, only that which is not of this world, not of this physical, can explain the physical. Right? I mean, I can't heal me because I'm physical and I got a physical infirmity. I need to get outside of me. Right? In order to get that healing. So whatever's of this world, not of the physical, is what can explain the physical. The physical can't explain itself. Only an uncaused cause could cause the universe to exist. <laughs> right? I mean, I love it. Because it, it, in not answering questions, it's answering all of my questions. You know, am I, is that making sense? Only that which exists beyond the laws of the universe could cause the laws of the universe to exist. Has to be something greater. Has to be something beyond. And it is kind of what I was talking about last week. Is this the dream? Or is that the dream? One of them is, but we're not sure which. What's the answer? God. God. By definition, I am. The one you can't explain, but explains everything. It's his unfathomability that causes our impossibility, our existence, to be in fact. The universe can never make sense of itself by itself. Nor can we ever make sense of our lives by our lives. Or can we by our lives give our lives meaning? That's why billionaires still go out and blow their brains out. Yeah. Because the one thing that will give meaning to their life is not more money, not more property, not more stuff, not more uh, uh, attention. God. The only way to find the meaning and the purpose of your life is to find it in a mystery. The mystery of him. And make that mystery the cause of everything that you do. Yes. And the reason for everything that you are. Yes. When, I had, when I was going through that, uh, man, I'd get these horrible, it wasn't like continuous headaches, but whenever I would change my vision, whenever I would change the focus of my vision, it was like getting stabbed in the back of your eyes. Just, oh my God, it was the most painful thing. Just your whole head just felt like it was going to explode. And all it was was you just shift your eyes to there and man, that just would come on you. Well, doing that, you know, I'm putting my hands over my eyes. And of course, I don't know if you've done this before, but it, it made, this is what it made me think of. 
speculating about what God has not revealed is like pressing your eyelids with your fingertips. The light that you think you see comes from your own imagination. You're not seeing any light. You're imagining it. We're to look at things that are not as though they are. I, I just, I hope that I've, through all of this crazy kind of seeming mumbo jumbo, you realize it is unexplainable. But that's the beauty of it. Because only he makes sense of it. You don't have to understand how your healing operates, how this deliverance takes place. You don't have to know it all. You just got to know that he does and put your faith in him and let go of yourself, let go of your understanding, let go of what you are trying to reason out and recognize if I stay in this word, it has to come to pass. This is infinite. This is finite. This can't be changed by this. It can only be changed by that. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for your patience. Amen. Go! In the plural. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name.